All right, so it is 7.02, and um, I think we should get started. Um, I am Liz Babent, president of Upper Fells Point Improvement Association. We have Brian Seal, vice president. Say hello, Brian. Uh, Joe Whitford, parliamentarian. Joe? Hello. Please send your full name, first and last, if you want to get credit. I have email addresses, just name with a first initial. Uh, in the chat. In the chat. Or sign in mm -hmm. with your full name. That also helps. John Betcher, mm -hmm. secretary. I know I'm missing people, so. You're here, John? John, sec I think I saw John on here. John Betcher? I don't see him now. He was here. And Pascal, are you here? He is our treasurer. He's here. Pascal? Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, we, we can hear you. Okay, I had to mute and unmute myself, thanks. Okay. So, um, are, is there anyone here that this is their first meeting? Larry? Yes. Okay, do you wanna introduce yourself? Um, I'm Larry Lambert. I'm president of Fells Point Corner Theater. Uh, Barbara and Molly and some people are scared to know that I'm actually showing up. Um, we, we have had a lot of discussions about um, our place in the neighborhood, in the community, and we wanted to reciprocate for all of the support that you have given us by being a part of your group and keeping up with the things that are happening in the neighborhood. And that's why I'm here. Welcome. Thank Welcome. You. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Okay, so we have a speaker tonight, Johns Hopkins. He's the executive director of Baltimore Heritage. Um, and they preserve and promote Baltimore's historic buildings and neighborhoods, um, as well as private homes. So I think it's very timely that he's joining us because right now we are working, we have a little historic neighborhood here and we're, we are working to um, rewrite our land use policy. So I think it's very timely that you're joining us, uh, Mr. Hopkins. And so I'm gonna let you um, take the floor. Hello. Well, um, well thanks, I'll, I'll be brief. And, uh, but, but first, Mr. Hopkins is my father. So please oh, call okay. me John. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so, uh, so just in uh, 10 seconds, Baltimore Heritage, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, you're looking at half of the staff. Uh, we were founded in 1960, um, and we have grown exponentially since then to, uh, to two staff. Um, so I'm half. Um, uh, and I thought maybe what I'd do is just talk uh, like literally for maybe a minute or two uh, on a couple topics. And then, uh, and then I know Zoom is not the best way to have kind of a back and forth dialogue. Um, but uh, but I, I would I hope to be able to use, uh, you know, the next 15, 10, 15 minutes um, to be helpful uh, and then can certainly leave you with my phone number and email address to, to try to talk after this. Um, but I know it sounded like a couple of the issues and, uh, and please step in if I'm, uh, if I'm not uh, getting them quite right. But, uh, you all are, are already a historic district. You're on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, and somebody cut me off if this is too basic, but the difference between being on the National Register of Historic Places and being a local CHAP district, is that something you all have covered in your meetings before, or is that worth going over a little bit? I, I think somebody? that would be, um, I, I think for the general, um, this uh, community meeting, I think that's a good thing to go over. Okay. So, so um, in, uh, in, again, in a nutshell, and I'm happy to go over this more in detail, um, but it's a little bit counterintuitive that being on the National Register of Historic Places, being recognized nationally, which is what you are, um, really has no uh, teeth as far as um, preventing things that you don't want to have happen, happen. Um, it, uh, the, only, the only area where being on the National Register does have teeth is when there's a federal project involved. And uh, we don't need to go through a history lesson, but the highway that was proposed to go through Fells Point 
um, jump over to Federal Hill through Montgomery Street and out. Um, that was blocked because um, Fells Point was designated as a National Register Historic District. And so that worked for Fells Point because it was a federal highway. Um, but, uh, but if you're a private developer, a private homeowner, a private whatever, um, being on the National Register of Historic Places um, doesn't provide any sticks. Um, and it does provide some carrots, which I'll talk about in a second, but it doesn't provide any sticks. If you want to paint your door day glow orange, you can do it. If you want to demolish your building and put up uh, something else, you can do it. Um, there's no real uh, protection, if you will, uh, by just by virtue of being on the National Register. Um, the difference between that and being a local historic district, a CHAP, uh, the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation, a CHAP district is that uh, if you, if, uh, CHAP districts, which Fells Point became one, uh, I want to say maybe five or six years ago, um, uh, as, a, as a tiny side note, interestingly, when the Fells Point folks were fighting against the highway in the 1970s, um, the city was all for it. And so there was this really long lasting distrust of anything that the city was doing. The Fells Point people said, you know, if the city is for it, if the city's involved in it, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So they did not become a CHAP district for 40, 50 years, um, but eventually just did become one uh, maybe five or six years ago. Um, but if you are a CHAP district, that means that whatever you do as a homeowner or a building, commercial building owner, um, you've got to get it approved through the CHAP commission. And so that's the basic difference. If you're a CHAP district, whatever you do on the outside of your house, you got to get approved. If you're in a National Register district, you don't need any approvals. The good part, and those are the, those are the sticks part. The carrots part are, if you're in, in either one of those, you get to take advantage of historic tax credits. And maybe I'll, I'll look over to the little tiny postage stamp picture that is uh, Ms. Bennett and say, have you talked about uh, tax credit incentives for the folks in Upper Falls Point? Is that, is that something you've already covered or? No, I think that would be good. Talk, talk about it. So, uh, okay, let me again try to give the nickel version. Um, and, then, uh, and then again, um, you, you, uh, if you don't know how to reach me, I'll, I'll try to give you my phone number and email and all that. Um, but you, because you all, uh, Upper Fells Point is officially designated a National Register Historic District, you are eligible for tax credits. And the punchline is, and I, I'm going to say this, um, uh, there's a difference between commercial properties, like if you own a row house and you rent it out as, uh, uh, as apartments, versus homeowners. And so let me, let me focus on homeowners, because um, I suspect that's probably what most of you all are. But again, happy to uh, talk a little bit about the other as well. Um, but if you're a homeowner and you're in Upper Fells Point and the district, the boundaries of the district are kind of funky. It goes from Baltimore Street down to Eastern Avenue and then a tiny bit east of Broadway, but uh, I'm sorry, a tiny bit west of Broadway and then east of uh, Broadway. Um, and, but if you're within that district boundary um, and, you do re and you do work on your house, you're eligible for a 20% off tax uh, credit from the state of Maryland. Um, and so if you do something like, uh, let's say you fix your roof and that's $5,000 and you put in central air conditioning, I'm gonna try to get to a round number because my math is not so good. Let's say you, you fix your roof and that's $5,000 and you put in central air conditioning. Here's, there's a, one of your members doesn't have air conditioning and I'm very sorry about that. Um, but that's 25,000, so you're up to 30. And then you paint the outside of your house and the inside of your house, and that's 10, so up to 40,000. Um, and then you uh, upgrade your electric. When I moved into my house, I think my electric, um, what is it? You, you go from 110 to 220. I think mine was like, like 30 when I moved in. So I had to upgrade. And, and you do a bunch of work, and that gets you to $50,000. And because you're in a historic district, the National Register Historic District, um, you get a tax credit from the state of Maryland for 20% of $50,000. And if my math is right, that's $10,000. And somebody, if, if you're a mathematician, okay, I got a thumbs up. For, is that your treasurer? If your treasurer's giving me the thumbs up, then I'm good here. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. I have a picture of um, So you're eligible, you get this $10,000 tax credit. And Maryland is the most generous state in the country for historic tax credits for homeowners. 
Um, and so let's say that year you owed the state $3,000 in income taxes. Um, when you filled out your state income tax form, which some of you may be doing even now, um, uh, you would owe no income taxes to the state of Maryland and you would get a refund from our comptroller for the difference for $7,000. You get a check back for $7,000. Um, and, uh, and you can get that check, the, the state will issue a check up to $50,000. So I'm gonna push the limits of my math here, but if you did a $250,000 renovation, 20% um, uh, of that is $50,000. Um, so it's a pretty substantial, the more work you do, the more uh, credit you get, the more money back. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's why Baltimore has uh, something like 80 different designated historic districts, including Upper Falls Point, um, is because uh, neighbors have come together to get officially designated to take advantage of that tax credit. Um, and then a, a final word is uh, uh, it, it applies to um, uh, sort of the things that you might think it would apply to, like restoring your marble mantle in your living room or whatever, or the crown molding um, or something like that, sanding your original wood floors. But it also applies to things like new plumbing and new electric and putting in central air conditioning and fixing your roof or fixing your leaking basement. So it applies to kind of the, the unsexy stuff too, uh, uh, but the stuff that's needed to keep your house from leaking and crumbling and rotting. So. Um, a really generous tax credit uh, that all of you, are, or as long as you're inside that district boundary, all of you are eligible for. Um, so, so, uh, so the good news from sort of as a neighborhood trying to, and I assume that you as a neighborhood association kind of trying to help control your own destiny, you know, how you grow as Upper Fells Point, um, you as neighbors having a, a seat at the table, so to speak. Um, the good news is that the historic tax credit can help uh, help save your roofs and fix your leaking basements. Um, but the bad news is that it doesn't uh, that it does not that it, it sort of all carrots no sticks. Um, so it does not prevent what some people might consider consider um, you know sort of um, uh, development or demolition that is not fitting of your historic neighborhood. Um, I don't know, I'm almost tempted to stop there and take questions, but I'll, uh, um, I, and if anybody knows me, um, and, and I'll, uh, I'll look to the, uh, uh, the Moonies there, they're like, you know I could go on forever. So um, uh, the two, the things, the other thing you have, and let me say one more thing, um, the other thing you have is in addition to historic districts is zoning. And I'm, I suspect if you all have a committee formed, you are, are, are already, uh, pretty knowledgeable about what you all are zoned for and not zoned for. And as probably most of you know, we went through a massive rezoning just a few years ago. Um, so the good news is we went through the rezoning. The kind of challenge is that uh, if you didn't like what the rezoning did, gee, it's a little bit harder to change because um, the city's position now is, hey, we went through this massive rezoning. This is what it is. Um, so they're, they're actually doing a review and re rewrite uh, oh, well, good. Um, of the zoning, not rewriting it, but actually re reviewing it and revising it. Um, the planning department is right now. That's, I, is, it, is that specific to Fells Point, Upper Fells Point, or is that? Because no. no? I know not, uh, I don't know if Misery Loves Company, but I know the folks in Woodbury, the Woodbury neighborhood along the Jones Falls, are, are also struggling with uh, the zoning that they have and what it allows and doesn't allow. Um, and so that's, uh, that's an issue for them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, oh, I know the final thing, somebody, uh, um, uh, Jan, I think, I don't, I don't know if it was Jan Mooney or somebody uh, said sort of like, what are the possibilities for uh, protection, particularly with height and for specific buildings? So, so zoning, um, uh, hist like getting yourself designated as a CHAP district is sort of like the, the ultimate uh, uh, dive into the deep end. You know, that's, uh, that's you want to, you, you really want to have control over where your neighborhood goes. Uh, and it's got it, it's sort of like a double-edged sword a little bit. It, uh, it, it allows 
neighbors to have control over what happens in the neighborhood, but it, but it does restrict what you as property owners can do as well. So if you want to put a, uh, an addition on your house, you need to get it reviewed. If you want to paint the front of your house, you need to get it reviewed. Um, so it is both carrots and sticks. Um, uh, for individual properties, um, there also is the possibility uh, for uh, getting an individual property designated as a historic landmark. Um, and that uh, similarly controls what can be done and what cannot be done on the property. Um, and if you're thinking, well, you know, the word landmark sort of connotes uh, big signature buildings like, you know, churches or civic centers or something like that. There are loads and loads and loads of uh, houses and other buildings um, that you might not think of as, uh, as landmark, quote unquote, but that are. And I know it's a little bit outside of your district, but um, relatively recently, uh, Johnny Eck, those of you who are movie fans uh, or painted screen fans, you know Baltimore's own Johnny Eck, the man born without uh, legs, but went on to, to uh, uh, be in Tarzan films and was a screen painter. Um, his two-story row house in East Baltimore is designated as a historic landmark. Um, so you can get all sorts of types of buildings designated. Um, and that similarly controls what you can do on the outside of the house. So I'm not, I'm not sure that was like super helpful, but I'm happy to try to answer specific questions if, um, or I'm happy to like keep talking about tax credits or historic districts until the cows come home. Uh, but uh, I suspect that might not be the best use of all of our time. I do have one question. As a nonprofit, is there any advantage to the theater in this program? It, it, uh, the answer is yes. Um, and it's, uh, it again is a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but the state of Maryland uh, has said that for nonprofit organizations, um, because you don't pay income taxes or, or property taxes, um, we'll just give you the full amount as a rebate. Um, and so if you know of organizations like uh, the nonprofit Civic Works that rehab Clifton Mansion on Hartford Road, um, uh, they took advantage of the historic tax credits and got 20% off of the cost of rehab work there. If you know Parks and People Foundation, um, they rehabbed a new headquarters uh, in a former superintendent's house in Druid Hill Park, um, just off of Reisterstown Road. Um, and they're a nonprofit and they took advantage of the historic tax credits. Um, and and uh, uh, Mr. Lambert, maybe, maybe offline, I could talk to you a little bit more. Um, sure. there's, uh, there's some downsides to it uh, because you gotta hire a lot of lawyers and a lot of like accountants to do it. And so it's, uh, the, I think if uh, the right word is the transaction costs for uh, nonprofits are high. For homeowners, there's, there's almost no transaction costs. You can do the application yourself, you submit it yourself. Uh, there are consultants that you can pay to help you out, but you really don't need them. Um, so the transaction costs can be uh, kind of you foregoing kind of a nice Saturday morning uh, and just sitting down and doing the application. But for nonprofits, there, there, there are some professional fees that are required. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, I, have, I have a question. So. Um, what, in order to become an, a national historic, uh, what did you call that, the home, uh, uh, on the National Historic Places Register? National Register of Historic Places. So what, what would it take, like what are they looking for in that application if you wanted to try to get a building or a home that you own on that? Well, you all, you all are already on it, or at least uh, part of your neighborhood is. Um, there is a district called Upper Fells Point National Register Historic District. Um, and it, 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 it goes from, and actually I could, uh, hmm, there's a, can I share my screen with you for a second? Can I try to, if this yeah, might crash think, the system. I think. Brian, you know that you you'll, you're going to know the answer. How does he share his screen? Can I can I try it? I see a green button down here yeah, that says share it. screen. Yeah, do right, it. Let me. If I if I get cut off, have a good evening, everybody, uh, and we'll uh, we'll regroup. Um, but let me try this. Share, uh, and then I'm going to go to right here. Um, oh, 
Can you see, and I'm not sure how to navigate, can you see that, the map? So, so I, for people who don't use this very often, you have to put it on the speaker view and then it'll make, it'll be on your entire screen instead of the little, um, little boxes. Ah, thank you. So, so this red district, this red line, Baltimore Street over, well, here's Broadway, this main drag um, over here. And then this is Gough Street, then down to Eastern. And I apologize, mine gets cut off because I'm seeing all your faces. Um, but this is the boundary line of, you, of what is already the designated Upper Fells Point um, National Register Historic District. And so- So I was talking about specifically like your one house, like how would you oh. get your own home? So if you have, and I don't know what the number is, but if you look in here, the hundreds, maybe a thousand plus houses, any old house inside this red line automatically qualifies for the tax credit. So right now, and I don't know, and I, and I apologize, I don't know if this red line boundary of your historic district matches what your Baltimore no, City not. neighborhood boundary is. Not really. Not, not really? Um, well, um, about uh, half of it does, but. About half, aye, yeah, yeah. So about half of, uh, half of your fellow neighbors are uh, just by living inside this boundary are, can get the 20% the tax credit. Um, you don't have to do anything special. You're, you're already pre-qualified, I guess maybe is the right word, um, just by living inside this boundary. If, so just, you are, if you're outside the boundary, um, it's a really tough deal. Basically what the neighborhood would have to do is go through a process to try to expand the boundary line. So expand it over here, if you can see my cursor, you know, kind of take in more of what uh, Upper Fells Point really is. Um, that's a process. Neighborhoods have done it. Um, Mount Vernon has done it twice. I think Bolton Hill has done it once. Um, uh, so I think Dickeyville did it. Uh, maybe Butchers Hill might have done it once. So you can do it, uh, but it's a process where you do a bunch of research or you pay a researcher to put together an amendment to say, hey, you know, when they drew this funky line, that really wasn't right. They should have drawn it over here in, in uh, a bigger catchment area. Um, this, so I don't know area, if that's, I'm sorry, go ahead. The area from Gough to Eastern, which is within our boundaries, is that part of the Fells Point Historic correct. District? That's correct, Barbara. Okay, okay, so uh, it is a historic district. Okay. So, so down here, you're, you're caught up in the, the Fells, Fells Point, Point District. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And where Upper okay. Fells Point is written is Butcher's Hills. Ah, yeah. okay. So, so maybe the folks, folks at least down here um, are, are covered, and, and you're saying maybe also up here in, in Butcher's Hill, kind of? Correct, correct. Ah, so maybe that's good news. Maybe most of you, maybe, maybe you're... Your label isn't Upper Fells Point, um, but you're still eligible for those tax right. credits. That's what it looks like. But but I guess there was there was some question. Someone had a question like for an individual home. You know the plaques out front, and they say this home. Oh. Is, you know what I mean? Like this home is on the National Register of Historic or is a historic place or something like so that you would get your own home, not tax credits, but just registered with a plaque. So um, what somebody did at some point in history was went to a plaque shop and bought a plaque that said those words. There is no official oh. designation. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it's just, <laughs> it's like going, do you know the cop shop uh, by the shot tower? You can yeah. walk in there and buy like a, a, a t-shirt that says police or a bat. <laughs> That's essentially what it is, is uh, you can put a plaque on your house that says anything you want. Um, at some point, a few people uh, apparently uh, bought a plaque that said uh, National Register District or something. So, I get but, it. Uh, okay. But if you want it, go for it. I think it's fantastic. But there's no, there's no program that uh, that pays for a plaque that uh, because you're part of the district. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you right, know I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. stop sharing here and we'll. Uh, okay. Do you know if you can apply the tax credit retroactively if you weren't aware of it? Um, uh, unfortunately, the answer is 100% no. 
um, I'm sorry, is that uh, John Becker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, 10 years ago, you used to be able to do that, a retroactive application, um, and uh, but they changed the rules um, so that you can no longer do that. And uh, it makes me cry about uh, once or twice a month, I get a phone call maybe from somebody like you who says like, I did all this great work. It looks fabulous. I restored this wonderful house. You should come and see it. And then I say, are you using the past tense? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, I already did it. And then I, I sort of cry and I say like, oh no. Um, so I'm sorry. Um, uh, maybe one of the take home messages though in, in a little bit more seriousness is, if you do have work on your house, and I'm sorry, John, uh, maybe not you, but, uh, but if you do have work, or maybe you do still have work left on your house, um, any amount of work over $5,000 qualifies. So, you know, if you, you fix your basement for 3,000 and you fix your chimney for 3,000, or let's say 2,000, so I can do the math, that's 5,000, you're eligible for a $1,000 tax credit. Um, uh, so any work moving forward, uh, but it is important to get your application in before you get your contractor out there or you start swinging hammers and stuff. That's good information. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Is no. it only on your primary dwelling or can it be on a rental? Um, it, it can be. It's, it is easiest on your primary dwelling. Um, if it's a rental property, you, uh, the state of Maryland has two, pro, two different programs. <laughs> Um, one is for um, uh, one is for homeowners, and that's five thousand dollars, and you get twenty percent off. The other is for everybody else, which is rental properties or commercial properties, and then you're put into a competitive application. Um, and uh, like I hate to kind of short sell anybody, uh, but it is so competitive that like if you own a uh, a row house and you're renting it out. You'll, you'll, you'll never get the state credit for that. Um, the city of Baltimore, though, also has a tax credit application, which I forgot to talk about, that if you spend more than 25% of the value of your house, so it's, it's the state is, is uh, you just have to spend $5,000, so relatively easy threshold. Um, the city is kind of for more of the major rehabs, but if you're spending more than 25% of the value of your house, whether it's a, a rental or a, a homeowner, whatever, um, you're eligible for a 10-year property tax credit um, that, that more or less keeps your property taxes at the level they were before the rehab started. Um, and let me give one quick example, and then, uh, and then again, I can shut up or go into it more. But let's say your house was worth $100,000 before you did the rehab. And again, this is, I'm, I'm using uh, a decimal, the 10 system here, because I can only do 10. So uh, your property taxes on your house are, what is, what are, what are we? We're like 3.1, 2.1%, right? Like $2,100 basically on a $100,000 house. If you went and put another $100,000 into it, you'd get what's called an out of cycle reassessment in your house that was worth 100 and you were paying $2,100 in property taxes is now worth 200,000 because you did all the chimney work and the, and the roof repairs and the central air conditioning and you'd be paying uh, 4,200, you'd be paying twice that. With the city's program, you can continue to pay the $2,100 for 10 years. And so if you multiply 10 years out by $2,100, that's $21,000, uh, which can be a significant, uh, a significant benefit for being inside that district. Um, and then you're saying, but wait a minute, you said you, we were in a national register district, not a local CHAP district. Um, so how were we eligible for the local CHAP tax credit? Um, the answer is that, that the city in its benevolence has said that uh, no matter what kind of district you're in, whether it's a national district or a local district, we, the city, will give you that property tax credit. So you all, as homeowners, as long as you're spending more than 25% of the value of the of your, your home or rental property, um, you can get that 10-year property tax credit. Let me, let and, me. and that's what it's called? It's called the Baltimore City 10-year property tax credit? <laughs> yeah, the okay. city agency that administers it is called the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. It's uh, kind of known by its acronym CHAP, 
the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Um, and it's part of the planning department. Um, okay. But if you get on your computer and you Google CHAP Baltimore, um, you'll get there. You, you actually, you might get to the pit beef stand out on Pulaski Highway. That's another one of the um, uh, top Google searches for CHAP. There's a pit beef stand called CHAPS uh, out on uh, Pulaski Highway. But if you go to the second fun. down, <laughs> you'll get to the city agency, um, which is the one you want. John, you should talk just briefly about uh, your five-minute uh, history series you've been doing. Uh, well, <laughs> if, well if, if you're trapped at home uh, and you need a distraction, uh, Baltimore Heritage, we, we as a nonprofit uh, do a lot of tours. I think in the pre-COVID year of 2019, we did something like 80 tours of 50 different places. Um, and then uh, COVID happened and we did exactly zero tours of any places because we were all locked down. Um, but I, I have pledged to do uh, virtual tours. Um, so uh, beginning, uh, we did one a day of a different historic place around the city. Um, I had to drop down to three a week because the rest of the world was catching up with me. Um, but if you want to uh, uh, Google, if you go on YouTube or you go on our website, baltimoreheritage.org, uh, and you want to make fun of my uh, attire, you will see this blue shirt a lot. My, uh, my wardrobe is not super extensive, um, but we've got about 60, 65 videos of various different historic places. Um, uh, maybe sometime coming up, maybe I'll do one, we'll try to do one on Fels, uh, Upper Fells Point. We'll do a- Yeah, uh, absolutely. A if you have any historic images, is, uh, or uh, or any kind of cool historic information, send them over and we'll, uh, we'll do one on, uh, on Upper Falls Point. That'll be really fun. That would be really, really fun. After the, going back to the CHAP thing, after the 10 years is done, then you go back to the normal taxes at the time? You do, you gotta, and let me give you a quick example. Um, in If you know the neighborhood Ridgely's Delight, um, that really fabulous little neighborhood by the stadiums. Um, there was a gentleman who bought a historic, and it, and it is a, a National Register Historic District. Um, a developer bought a church, a historic church, um, for $40,000 and turned it into four condominiums. And this was probably back in like 2005 or six or something like that. Um, and so the and condo, condos pay property taxes like everybody else. Um, and so the pre-rehab value on those condos, so $40,000 for the church, four condos in the church, each condo assessed at $10,000. So the pre-rehab uh, pre uh, tax assessment was $120 per condo. He did a fantastic job rehabbing that church and he sold each condo for $500,000. Um, and so the property tax on $500,000 is, gosh, I can't even do that math, but it's a lot. It's like $15,000 or maybe even more than $15,000. So the, the, and he marketed it, the, the, uh, the developer marketed it that, you know, you're going to buy this half a million dollar condo, but for 10 years, you're going to be paying $120 in property taxes. Um, and that was an enormous savings for the people who bought those condos. Um, for 10 years, but in year 11, they had better kind of uh, uh, take a deep breath or tighten their belt or done something because their property taxes were going to go from $120 to like $15,000. Um, so it's good for 10 years, but not longer than 10 years. Okay, so um, thank you. I'm not going to call you Mr. Hopkins. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us this evening. It was very informative and interesting to listen to. And uh, I'm sure some of us will be listening to those five minute history uh, series that you have, so. And I'm gonna sign off, but if you have, um, I do not work for the city or the state, and so I'm not a tax credit reviewer, but we do try to help people, especially over the phone. So if you've got a project or a set of projects, some, some maintenance or rehab work, and you want to kind of run, uh, bounce some ideas or bounce some things off of somebody, um, I'm happy to try to help. Um, you can find me if you just Google Baltimore Heritage or baltimoreheritage.org. Uh, that's us. And my phone number's on there. And my email is my last name, Hopkins, um, at baltimoreheritage.org. Um, so you can send me an email also. And, uh, I'll try to try to be as helpful as I can.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Good luck. All right. Bye. Um, Luke, I am wondering, since you're on, before we get started in all of our committee uh, meetings, so you don't have to sit here in, in, uh, indefinitely, if you would like to go um, and give us um, a quick update, a quick legislative update. Sure. I know that other members of the delegation have spoken uh, to you as well, so I'll try and keep this relatively quick. Um, I'm Luke Klippinger, uh, one of your three members of the House of Delegates. Uh, in uh, 2019, I was made the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, so I'm one of the six uh, major committee chairs in Annapolis. Um, I serve with Brooke Learman, your closer neighbor, and Robin Lewis, uh, and I live across the, the water here in Riverside. Um, I'll, I'll be quick. The Judiciary Committee deals with four different uh, main areas of the law. We deal with criminal law, civil law, um, family law, and juvenile law. Um, we have been very busy uh, during the interim. As, as you're all aware, our legislative session ended in uh, the middle part of March, normally ends the second week of April. We ended 20 days earlier because of COVID. Uh, but my committee has had uh, several uh, hearings where we've uh, exerted some oversight over the Department of Juvenile Services, over the Department of Corrections, and over the judiciary um, as we try to figure out how they're responding to the uh, COVID crisis. Uh, DJS uh, has uh, been uh, reducing the number of kids that are being held in their facilities. Uh, they have had some. Uh, kids early on who have uh, tested positive for COVID. Since then, it has been a little better, but not as good um, in some of the privately run facilities that DJS contracts with. Uh, at Department of Corrections, they had some problems earlier on, but they have been uh, working through those problems. Both of the, those agencies have challenges with staff members who are um, coming into the facilities after going home at night. And, and it is a challenge to prevent uh, people from uh, picking up the virus at home and, and bringing it with them to the facilities. They have been working to try to mitigate that. Um, we have, I've been uh, in regular contact with both of the secretaries of those agencies to make sure that the people who are being held um, are being held as safely as we can at this point. The judiciary has started up, uh, they're having hearings again. Uh, uh, and if you get a letter in the mail that indicates that you've been chosen for jury duty, it is not a joke, we think. Um, they are um, going to be uh, starting jury trials in the second week of October. Um, so it is possible that you will get a notice uh, for, for jury trial here in the near future. District courts are already starting with uh, some lower level cases, so you might get summoned to that. But one of the challenges with the judiciary uh, has been that of access to justice. And one of the things that I've been part of in, in the last uh, several weeks has been trying to figure out funding for organizations like Legal Aid, who can provide assistance to people who are having challenges um, with eviction or other kind of civil matters which are all too common right now, um, the they, uh, organization uh, Legal Aid and its affiliates across the state have seen a dramatic increase in requests for assistance, and they have a, a big gap in their budget that we're going to try and figure out um, and, and working with the judiciary and working with others. Um, I should mention one of the ways that we fund Legal Aid is through interests on lawyers' escrows accounts and right now, interest rates are basically zero. So they're having a very difficult time with their existing funding sources. Um, so all of this is dreadfully exciting to talk about. Um, but the, the issue, and I don't mean to give it short shrift, but the issue that we are, that the committee is working on in greater detail and will continue to work on leading up until uh, the 2021 legislative session is that of police accountability uh, and police responsibility. We have, uh, the speaker and I have set up a work group uh, that consists of people from across the house, not just on the Judiciary Committee, uh, to look at issues 
related uh, to police uh, accountability. They're re reviewing policies and procedures related to police misconduct, building on some of the work that, that I've been able to lead on the committee um, with regard to police accountability. Uh, we're looking again at use of force policies and whether we should uh, stat make those statutory as opposed to just uh, regulatory. Um, and we're also looking at the independent prosecution of law enforcement um, misconduct. So one of, the, one of the big challenges that has occurred in different parts of the state is you have um, misconduct such as uh, what happened with uh, anti-black in, in uh, Caroline County and issues were raised from the community uh, about whether the prosecutor there should have been prosecuting uh, or see, deciding whether to prosecute the officers in a pretty small uh, police department um, when they kind of, you know, they know each other, they work with each other a lot, can you be truly fair in those circumstances? There are some people who, some prosecutors who want to hold on to that jurisdiction, including the uh, uh, state's attorney here in Baltimore City, uh, state's attorney Mosby, uh, but there have been others who think that there really needs to be an independent look and whether that's uh, the attorney general or some other um, uh, agency, we are, we are looking at that as well. Um, we, we have made some uh, steps and we have made some progress in the past, but it hasn't been enough. And that's why we're working through the interim to see what we can have ready to go when we go back into session in January, because we need to see the tangible reform that restores trusts and helps build real relationships uh, with the people who the police are uh, supposed to be serving. So with that, I think I managed to get that all in about four or five minutes. I'm happy to take any questions you have and, and then you can uh, go from there. Maybe I'm used to being around lawyers. Everybody's got a question usually for me, but nobody here has a question for me. I don't know what to do. Well, you know, I actually thought and I hadn't even really thought about the jury and like the access and the trials continuing and stuff. So can you, um, for the people who that, I mean, if I would have thought about it long enough, it would have crossed my mind, but it, I, it hadn't crossed my mind. So some of the things that really were specific to this pandemic that has kind of is bottlenecking the process is completely stopped the process. Like what, that's just amazing. I hadn't even thought of it. So in, in my day job, I'm a, an assistant state's attorney in Anne Arundel County. And, and it right now, I mean, I have cases sitting on my docket from November of last year, some of them from October of last year. Normally, we have 180 days that we have to, uh, where we have to get a case from beginning to end. Um, we're beyond that now, and we're beyond it because in many cases, we, we simply couldn't, couldn't try those cases. Um, so there is a bottleneck. Now, in my office and across the state, in, in some offices, I will say, um, I don't know if it's in every office, we, I believe, and I know myself personally, I looked at the cases that I have on my docket and said, okay, um, is this person being held? If the person is being held, is it for a violent crime? Um, or is it for a crime that is nonviolent? And if, it, if it's for a nonviolent crime, you know, are they dealing with other issues um, that would otherwise preclude their release? Um, I feel like my office, and I'm certain we're not perfect, I'm certain somebody could look and find examples of people that we, we should get out of the way, and there is always gonna be differences of opinion, but we've tried very hard to, to uh, identify people who really don't need to be held and, and, I, and, and get them out of detention facilities. So part of the challenge that we're dealing with with the judiciary, and we're not dealing with, with, with the judge, just with the judicial system as it stands, is there are some people that, that there are some defendants, they want a trial, there are, and there are some cases that, that are just uh, too, too bad, uh, the, the facts are not great and, and uh, for, uh, to let the person out on their own recognizance. So we have that backlog of cases on the criminal side. We have a backlog of cases on the civil side. Um, and 
as I mentioned, when it comes to uh, evictions or, or issues related to debt collection or anything along those lines, those cases have also been backing up, but they're gonna start moving in the next, in the next several weeks and months. And, and that creates a challenge um, in, in the uh, justice system. So when it comes to having juries for either a civil or a criminal case, I mean, one of the things that a lot of us are wondering how we're gonna do, if I have a, a case that's gonna go to a jury trial, the, the smallest number of people that I'm gonna ask for for a jury pool, and then we do voir dire, we pick, pick the jurors between the state and the defense, is 40 people. So if we do six trials a day, there are only 13 judges in uh, Anne Arundel, I think there are 30 something in Baltimore City. If you did six a day, you need 240 people, at least, who are gonna be coming to court, socially distanced, the whole nine yards. And then add to that the witnesses, the victims to the crime, the police officers, if, it, if it's a crime, in civil cases, the experts, and you have a lot of questions that, that and a lot of challenges, but the, the, uh, um, the chief judge has been slowly making their way through, and we're gonna see how this, uh, this works in October, uh, but it adds to a whole range of uh, different challenges for, for people in any number of different ways. And I, let me mention one other that is actually a, a big challenge, two that are really big challenges, um, domestic violence. Um, the ability for people to get peace and protective orders is is a little bit harder now, a lot harder now. And kids that are the victims of child abuse, um, it's it's harder to get those kids out of difficult situations when, if the kid doesn't have any place else to go. Um, so, yeah, they're they're uh, I sort of wrongly I guess joke uh, that I'm I'm on I'm on the fun time committee. Uh, we get we get all the fairly challenging issues, and and there are a lot of very very challenging issues for us right now, um, as we try to work our way through this. And to say nothing, if we get a surge, if we get a surge and we have to start closing down again, it just creates more of a bottleneck. It's a long lawyerly answer. I'm sorry. I've been told I answer too too long. Sorry. Was there a question in the chat, and then? The, any thoughts about the potential of a federal police presence? Um, Luke, I, thank you. Thanks for yeah. joining us. We're going to have to um, cut this short a bit just because we have a lot of committees to get through. We really enjoyed every, not enjoyed everything you had to say, but. <laughs> it's totally a fun committee. It. It's the fun committee. <laughs> but it was important, um, important information. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Very briefly, I don't think we need a federal police presence in the city of Baltimore. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening. Thank you, Luke. Luke, you. Luke can you put in the chat what our response could be if we have a federal presence? Can you just put in the chat what the city could do? Thank you. Um, Suzanne, I'm, I'm happy to, I need to think about that a little more. Okay. I, that, that's, a, that's a broader legal question, but I will drop my email in the chat. If you need help, okay. it, just let me know. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, before we get on to the committee reports, um, we just have one thing that we need to vote on that's, I think, very brief. I think it could be a very brief vote, and it, it has to do with our meeting policy. Um, our meeting policy said that we had um, association meetings shall normally be held at 7 p.m. on the third Tuesday of every month, except December, at Wolf Street Academy. It also said that our board meetings consisting of the officers, committee chairs, organizers, and other interested members shall be held at 7 p.m. on Tuesday following all association meetings in the back room of Henninger's Tavern. And so of course, that's not happening right now. So um, we just need to make a, have a vote on changing that policy. I guess you know when it was written, no one ever thought that we wouldn't be able to go to those places. So if we can take, if we would like to vote on the following proposed change to the meeting policy. Association meetings shall normally be held at 7 p.m. on the third Tuesday of every month except December. Board meetings consisting of officers, committee chairs, organizers, and any other 
interested members shall normally be held at 7 p.m. on the Tuesday following all association meetings. All meetings will be held at a convenient location, preferably in the UFPIA's neighborhood boundaries or as a virtual meeting in times when a physical location is not feasible. So we just need to vote to just allow us to do that and change that part of the policy. Do we have a second? I second it. Okay. Uh, so, because, yes, let's. So, so let's, can we take a vote or? Yes, uh, all those opposed? Nobody is opposed, the motion carries. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. You starting to look like a hippie there, babe. <laughs> no, I haven't got a haircut since February. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <And> me. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna go on to the treasurer's report. So, Pascal. Thank you, Liz. Um, so for this month, right now, we have uh, $12,130.58 in our accounts. Um, that includes, as I believe I mentioned, Matt, last month, we have paid our, uh, our, our liability and general insurance for the year, which is a big, significant annual expense. Um, taxes for the last tax year have also been completed and submitted. Uh, in case for those who are wondering, the uh, total revenue last year was $15,248, and total expenses were $15,891. Okay. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, we're moving right along to beautification. Lisa. Hi everybody. Um, so we've been really busy regardless. We've been practicing social distancing and doing most of our stuff outdoors, but we do have a couple of things going on right now. Um, I guess the newest thing is that Mark Hoffman on his way back down to Baltimore. No, you're not in Baltimore. When are you coming to Baltimore? Tomorrow? He's picking up bumpers, street bumpers, that we will be installing to protect some of our new trees um, from getting backed into. Um, so some of our new younger trees and some of the ones that are established maybe for three years or so um, are very vulnerable to being backed into if there's no like uh, bricks around, which we're actually not encouraging people to do elevated bricks around. So um, that was something that we had voted on, that we had presented in our budget. We are within budget and um, Alma and Mark are kind of spearheading that to a certain extent. Um, and we found a very good rate in Philadelphia. So he's picking them up on his way down to Baltimore from New York. So thank you, Mark, for that. Um, then um, please water your trees. It's really hot out there. A lot of the young trees are supposed to have about 20 gallons of water a week because um, their roots don't go down as deep. And so please, um, you know, we put a lot of energy um, over the last three years in getting new trees. If you if you can go out and water them. We have ooze tubes, which require, um, they're like these big hot dogs that go around the tree. Um, you have, they hold 20 gallons, they'll seep out very slowly over a week's time. Those are ideal, um, but you have to be able to have a hose to fill them up because it's 20 gallons of water. Um, I have lots of them. Tree Baltimore gave us a couple boxes of them and I have them. You don't even have to coordinate with me. You can pick them up. Um, they're under the stoop at 209 South Wolf Street. And the instructions of how to install them are, are printed on the ooze tube, like in multiple places. So please help yourself if, you're, if you can water a young tree. Um, the other thing is um, the recycling cans. We've kind of put that on hold right now because there was so much confusion around recycling and trash pickup. We're not going to really push that right now. We'll push that again in the fall. Uh, but we have probably about five or six more of those of our own little Upper Fells Point Improvement Association recycling cans because we created a sticker that looks like a bumper sticker that goes on them. Um, sidewalk planters, we're also going to wait because it's so, so hot and you really have to have people watering and it's just really hard in the dead of summer to plant new plants. Spring is really the time or the fall. So we're gonna wait and pick up on that in the fall. Our first, our two dumpsters for 
um, the year were canceled because of COVID. Um, it's very possible. We were hoping that maybe they would, this would pick up and we would get ours in August. We don't know that yet. We're going to um, wait and find out just, you know, it may, may not happen, but we are continuing to do a weekly cleanup together with um, the Saturday morning cleanup, which is a Facebook group. Um, we've had really generous neighbors who have picked up the tab to have Lilo, who lives in our community, haul um, the entire collection. Um, so this last time, actually, Upper Fells Point Improvement Association paid for the haul, but all the way this entire year, other residents have just paid out of their pocket. So that's been really great. And the, usually what happens is a, a site is picked, and then people go around, pick up trash. Um, if we have a truck, we'll pick up bulk trash, and, um, and then Lilo will come and pick it up, and then we pay him through pay PayPal. So that's been working out really well. Um, we are um, looking, we are in communication with the owner at 1900 East Pratt Street. Um, I, this is a total long shot, but there was a community member who approached me and said it would be great if we had a mural on the, on the west facing facade of that building. Um, Kurt and, her, and Allie, who are kind of, um, kind of communicating with the um, owner just because he does have a CHAP application in. So, hey, for tax credits that we all now know plenty of. Um, and that actually might slow down his application. So that may be a reason that he wouldn't be open to moving forward with it. But we do, he did, we sent him a certified letter. He responded to us. He said he, he would think about it. And now Ali and Kurt are moving forward with that. Um, and then um, the last thing is we have, no, there's two more things. The last thing is we've moved our beautification station, our official beautification station to the to 113 South Bethel Street. It's a half a block out of our boundaries, but it's a huge lot. This last weekend, we got a dump truck of mulch um, and we needed a big lot for that. So Peruse, who owns the lot, um, has given me a key for the gate and has um, this last weekend, we shoveled and moved a whole dump truck of mulch into that lot. Hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get some dirt, but that's kind of where the big materials are, are being stored, like the mulch, the dirt, the pavers, the big trash cans. We're hoping to find a place in the community to do a little shed for like trash bags and pickers in the community and things like that. And then the last thing is, um, although it's not really related to beautification, um, myself, Beth, and my husband both uh, revived a little library and um, we um, put it, it is now on the 200 block of uh, Durham Street on Lady Day Way. And um, it's being, it's become kind of popular. I've been wanting to put it on next door and I keep putting, but anyway, so this is our new little library. Um, and then I think that's it, but it, oh, one more thing. We were supposed to submit a request today. The deadline is today. I'm gonna see if we can get um, an extension for tree requests from Tree Baltimore. I just have not had the time to pull that together. So if you have a um, stump in front of your house, and it has to be kind of done this evening because I have to turn around and submit it tomorrow. If you have a stump in front of your house, I have a couple of, on my list, but you, I need to know the diameter of the stump, um, and then I will put it into 311, and then if you want a new tree, let me know. If there's a dead little tree, like one that we could literally just pull out by the trunk because it's only like an inch and a half, um, then just let me know that too. I need the address and then that way I'm just gonna kind of put something in to have something in so we might be able to get some trees in the fall. I'm just really behind on that stuff. If you have any questions, you can always email me at um, beautification at upperfellspoint.org. We have an awesome team, a lot of great energy, so thank you to everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a lot going on. You're doing a lot of work. Um, community Garden is next. So, Jan? Okay, hi, everybody. Um, in case you wondered what's going on on the mosaic sidewalk in front of the garden with the cones, we have a damaged area of the tile. Um, we're having to redo that whole panel. It's about a, I don't know, three foot or four foot uh, piece. So we're doing that in the artist studio. Once that's done, then we're going to take out the old piece and hopefully slide in the new one easily, but it'll take us a little while to put that together. So please don't move the cones or walk on that area. And thanks for your cooperation. 
during this time. Um, our August Honey Happy Hour has been canceled due to COVID. We are working on uh, creating a virtual garden ramble tour to show off spaces um, in front of your house or your garden in the back, or maybe it's on your deck. We're going to be doing this in mid-September as a fundraiser. So we need some people that are willing to show their gardens virtually. Um, it can be just, you know, in front of your house, like I said, or deck or whatever. So please contact uh, Tasha at fundraising at upperfeldpoint.org if you would like to be a host. It's a virtual host. All, you, all we have to do is uh, submit a short video or still pictures and we're going to compile a video um, of the tour and we're going to incorporate some other fun things with that uh, so it's still sort of in the planning areas but if you would like to be, to showcase uh, something at your house then please let her know um, let's see we still have note cards tote bags glasses for sale so if you're interested, let me know. Um, I'll go ahead on to media since I'm already talking. <laughs> uh, sponsor news, sadly, Pan Canteen has permanently closed because of the COVID. So that was very sad to see them go. I don't know if anyone mm. tried their type, but it was very good. Um, also, Pratt Liquors has been trying to accommodate everybody, but they've been inundated with an excessive number of packages. So they are now charging a dollar for every package delivered to their store. Um, a lot of people are just having packages delivered and not buying anything from him. So please, you know, occasionally buy something to help him stay in business too, as he's been a good neighbor um, doing the packages. Um, let's see, Happy Hour Heaven is now open with outdoor seating. They are closed on Mondays until August. The deadline for our August newsletter is August 3rd. Uh, it's still up in the air when we're going to go back to print. So we'll keep you posted. Um, I guess that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. Um, okay, next is education. Um, Molly. Okay, uh, I thought I'd do a update on the situation with uh, Baltimore City Schools. Um, as you may have heard, uh, they will be going entirely virtual to start. Uh, teachers will be returning on August 26th. And the proposed start date for uh, students is uh, Tuesday, September 8th. Uh, that hasn't been finalized. Um, if you want specifics, you can find it at uh, BaltimoreCitySchools.org. Um, that has details. They're going to be reevaluating mid-October uh, for the rest of the school year. Um, and, um, you know, it's sort of a, it, it's in process, uh, right now. Um, the private schools are doing variations. Uh, for instance, Christo Ray, uh, will be doing three days remote, one day in school, and one work day. I think I have that right. But the bottom line is that the private schools um, maybe having a variation on that. Um, anything about that? Um, there was any questions about that? Uh, Councilman Cohen, I thought this was important. Um, there was a resolution today that was passed uh, about closing the digital divide. Um, a resolution um, that was put forward uh, actually calling on Comcast to extend uh, the Internet Essentials Program 
that serves uh, low-income families uh, with internet access through the reopening of public schools. And uh, if anybody wants that, there are currently, I was uh, currently enrolled in the digital, in the internet essentials program. And according to the ABLE Foundation, 40% of uh, Baltimore City uh, ho uh, I think residents do not have internet access. So in terms of education and schools, that's kind of really critical. And um, so keep an eye on that. And, um, and the final thing I have are note cards, <laughs> which um, have been selling pretty well. But if you would like more, they're very, very cute. Let me know. In the last two months, we've uh, sold about $150 worth, but I have plenty more. So uh, just get in touch with me, five for $10. They're very cute. Uh, and I think that's my report, unless there are questions. Thanks, Molly. Thanks sure. for the update. Um, the next up would be fundraising. Is there someone here for fundraising? I did it for Tasha about the ramble, garden ramble. Oh, okay. So that's, that's done. Okay. So the next will be um, Matt Barnes um, and he will talk about safety. Matt. Good evening, everyone. Um, just a couple announcements. I'll make this uh, pretty quick. Um, we have planned three stoop sets um, over the next three months. Um, the first one is August 6th, next one is September 3rd, and the final one is October 6th for National Night Out. <clears throat> All your neighbors and yourselves are encouraged to go outside, meet your neighbors, um, collaborate, network, talk with each other, um, and just get out because nobody's been able to do that um, for a few months now. Of course, responsibly social distance, um, but um, really it's a networking um, a networking exercise and really it's just to make yourself very visible and make everyone aware that, you know, this is a neighborhood that is, um, it has a lot of camaraderie and um, that it's, <clears throat> a safe place and enjoyable place to live. Um, National Night Out um, for on October 6th. Um, it'll have a little bit different look uh, than it has in years past. Um, it'll be, like I said, a combination of stoop sits around the neighborhood, probably street by street. Um, light snacks and beverages will be provided. Um, we're looking for a few street volunteers, um, basically to serve as hubs for distribution of drinks and food. Um, it's not really making you a host per se, but it is making you kind of like a place where, you know, when we supply the beer or the water or whatever snacks that we can get, um, you're able to hand them out and uh, give them to your neighbors. And um, it's kind of like, like I said, basically a little area for people to gather. Um, <clears throat> Um, let's see here. I started a camera registry for the, um, for the neighborhood. And, uh, like I said last time, I pretty much have every camera that I could visibly see on all the streets, uh, through here. Um, so like I went through register and Durham, Wolf, Chapel, Washington, Lumberd, Pratt, Golf, and Bank, and just kind of wrote down what I saw, whether it be, um, a ring or nest or just random cameras and I started a spreadsheet and I'm looking for volunteers to help me fill out this spreadsheet. Um, I'll share my screen real quick. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, Can everyone see that? No. 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 All right. Hold on here. 
Did you push the green share screen thing? Yeah, you know, you know, Barb, you'd think this was not my first rodeo, and it really isn't. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. Share screen. Right here. There it is. Not now. Can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, this is how the spreadsheet is set up. I'm looking for names and contact information, and um, this is not this is not directly um, uh, tied to the City Watch. Um, it's basically only for our use, um, whether it be problem areas or a crime or some sort of incident happens. Um, basically, if someone contacts me or someone within the community, we can go through here and look through everyone's. Um, Look through the database and possibly reach out to see if anyone has any footage to help maybe possibly solve or apprehend or kind of figure out what happened um but at one time i think dan was going to help me do this um and then kind of covid struck and so it kind of went on the back burner and like i said i just kind of took it upon myself and went through all the houses there and um and that's kind of what I've come up with. And people have been emailing me and uh, sending me their, their contact information, um, from, whether it be from the newsletter or from past meetings. Uh, so that's very much appreciated. But like I said, if anybody can help me with this, um, fill this out, uh, other than Lisa, because she's pretty busy, um, I greatly Don't appreciate it. Don't let her do anything else. What's that? Don't let her do anything else. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I said. She, at one time, she said she had uh, she had every, probably a lot of these addresses tied to a tree pit, and um, <laughs> so uh, and she was um, gonna. Matt, what, what do you need? You need someone to like go what rap on doors and and get the contact information or? Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of these houses you probably know your neighbors, and you can just contact them and let them know that it's on the registry, and um, let them know, ask them if it's okay, and reach out um or you can wrap on doors whatever whatever anyone would like to do Matt, uh, i'm still in i just the isolation didn't help that's all that's fine okay well dan the spreadsheet's made for you and we can get we can get together off off of this and um i can share it with you and sure I'll do some too i'll help um sure I just make the spreadsheet shareable and we can all just work on filling it in okay well i'll take Three. The membership list too for the people that we already know have paid their dues. We should already have that information. So True. I did. I did hear you guys. I stepped away from the desk for a second, but I ha I do have a master spreadsheet. So what I can do um, is um, like just sort it by cameras, and then we can see if I've gotten if I have any more contact information based on beautification efforts or memberships because I consolidated like a gazillion lists um, together. So um, Matt, you and me should probably figure out how um, we want to do this. I could probably put it up on the Google Drive. The only thing is it includes a lot of other information because it includes whether there's a tree pit, it talks about whether it's a new tree, whether there, you know, it has, we're going to be putting bumpers in there, the street, you know, all the kind of stuff that we are doing as a community association for the address is going to be there. So you and I, we can talk about that um and how you want to do it i'll accommodate however you want me to do it okay and, and we'll get dan involved too because he can he, he's willing to volunteer to help us out so uh, that's that's good thank you guys very much on that that was very easy wow okay so matt is another question though is don't we need to know if they want to be part of the city camera watch group we can ask that as well yes okay i think we should ask them that but a lot of people have been apprehensive to that so um uh, like I said, this is not directly tied to it. It's strictly for our personal use as we want to use it. And um, of course, I mean, the, the police, if, if something happens, the police and the police do any sort of research and they know that you have a camera, I mean, they, they can get the footage regardless. So, I mean, you really don't, you have some rights, but, um, but that is that. Um, the net, the final one, um, Final area to discuss is basically a proposed block street liaison program. Um, I spoke with a few um, other um, safety chair people, um, Canton, Patterson Park, um, mostly Arch and Joe Colbert. Um, Zeke kind of 
wanted to promote this um, to kind of create a network or, um, within our, a safety network within our community. And um, really, I don't want to I don't want to describe it as a sort of um, you're not really a hall monitor or anything. Really, um, it's basically just a networking tool. Um, and so what we're looking for is people to cover, uh, register Ann, Durham, Wolf, Chapel, Washington, Lombard, Lombard Pratt, Golf, and Bank Streets. Um, a couple of those streets could have multiple people because um, you know those blocks are fairly large. Um, like Golf and uh, a Bank and those places are only like 1,700, 1,800, 1,900 blocks so there's not there aren't too many houses so maybe one person could handle that but um just kind of talking with arch and um joe and how they started setting theirs up because they this is basically fairly new um it's basically community policing that's what they're calling it or kind of trying to propose it as um the basic liaison responsibilities would be like meet neighbors and gather contact information um, each block uh, would create a Facebook group or an email contact group, um, which at the end I'll let Liz kind of describe what she does. Um, your basic task would be forward and relay city neighborhood street information. Uh, for example, trash or recycling pickup changes, uh, suspicious activity, um, you'd form lines of communication. Um, Basically, you could use it as a tool to check up on elderly or special needs neighbors. Um, network, help and look out for one another. Uh, keep an eye on someone's house if they travel. Um, or tell people they need to straighten up. Say they have a lot of shit on their street. Like, hey, you kind of get together and say, well, it's time. Hey, you can privately message them and say, you know, you need to tidy up. Um, you know, you let your recycling out overnight and there's garbage all over your sidewalk. Um, let's try to clean that up and be more responsible next time. Like I said, it's not a hall monitor. I apologize, my dog is barking. Harper, get over here. Um, and, um, and last would probably be report any safety issues or concerns with the safety chair, which that would be me. And probably the inverse would be true. If anything came up, say, um, you, we had like a mugging or, or, um, or a carjacking or something. I, and I knew about it first, I would probably reach out and similar, like basically we could, I could utilize the camera tools or any tools that we could use to communicate to possibly help something be solved or figure it out or, um, or, um, you know, be of help to one another. Um, or share tools like um, a lot of people don't know if you do have an incident in the community. Um, the state district attorney, the, the district attorney's office, they offer services such as counseling and, and um, help if you're a victim of some sort of crime. So, but like I said, um, that's kind of the basic street block liaison information. Um, I'll probably make it in prettier form because uh, um, Brian asked me to do it one time and this was kind of like the quick thing that I made the other day um, just to kind of display and show what we think that it should look like and um, Liz I'll let you kind of speak on what um, you guys do with your street or with your Facebook group. So I mean it can be it, we don't it can be very easy. We just have um, started this 300 block of South Chapel Facebook group. And we can communicate through that Facebook group, whatever, whether there's, uh, you know, maybe something unsafe going on, or um, if we want to do a um, block party, or we want to um, everybody, hey, let's everybody get out and um, weed the street because it's getting weedy, which it is right now but it's just a great tool to communicate and it's a very friendly block and it, it's just a, a friendly tool. It's not like, you know, people have to go out and police the block or anything like that, but 
we all take part in it. And I think that if everybody set up their block like that, um, it's just, it's a very easy way to communicate and to, to get to know your neighbors and be friends and to collaborate on things. If someone has extra plants, they say, hey, I'm gonna put them out front. Somebody might wanna plant these, things like that. It's just, it just, it, it, it builds community. And I think that would, that might be a nice thing if somebody wants to take charge on every block, if you want to take charge on your block, I think that would just be a great tool to do that. Yeah, it's it's not a huge responsibility or time commitment. And like I said, it's a it's a great networking tool. And um and I think it can be beneficial. Our community is pretty easy because it's not huge, it's not as big as Canton. I mean, I think we have 30 blocks or Canton had like 200 and some. So I think Joe's having a little bit tougher time trying to organize it. Um, but heck, if we had 15 volunteers or one volunteer from each one of those streets or two or three from each street and you could break it up, um, that would be a huge help. And I think it would be pretty easy to get started. So if you guys want to volunteer or you think that you want to do it, um, heck, I know that if, if I just look down Ann Street, there are people hanging out down there every day across from Bender's kind of diagonal. Um, they have, they've obviously all built a relationship and they all hang out a lot. And one person from that group, since they know everyone and everyone knows each other, they would volunteer. I think, Caroline, don't you live on that street? Oh, you don't? Okay, I thought you looked familiar. I thought you had a golden retriever. Um, but the, um, it's, like I said, it's pretty easy looking for volunteers and if anyone wants to do it, pretty easy commitment. I'll help you get set up. I know Brian, Brian Magali was interested at one time, but he also does uh, the beautification committee stuff. So, but um, that's all I got. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. Uh, the next person will be Jeff May with uh, a land use update. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everybody. So as Liz made a comment earlier this evening to, about how we are, we have a goal now of rewriting our land use guidelines. And part of that goal, we began on the 5th of July, or 6th of July, I think we had a, a first brainstorming session. Um, we had a Zoom meeting to find out what kind of issues people you know, felt were important. Schedule at least two more of those. Can't hear you. Can't hear me. Can anyone hear me? I mean, how do you hear it? How, do, how does this sound? Sounds okay right now. Breaking up. Does this sound better without the mic? Yeah. Without the mic? Yeah. Okay. So we had a meeting, a brainstorming session for land use. Uh, on the 5th, 6th of July, we're going to have two more. We created a land use uh, email distribution list. So if you're interested, I mean, you heard the speaker earlier tonight, spoke a lot about some of the factors we've been considering, zoning, historic uh, designations. So if those things are of interest to you, um, you can drop a line to me or Brian. Brian and uh, I can control the, um, the distribution list. And we'll put out a public notice about the next brainstorming session. And the other thing I was going to share is um, Canella, what used to be Canella, the owner for that new owner has, um, you know, she came to our association, I think, in November. She did not get, she did not get her license transfer because of a technicality. So the liquor board made her hold a new hearing. Uh, she's actually docketed for the 30th. Um, and if the license transfer goes through, she should be able to, she'll probably begin opening. Uh, she's requesting the liquor license and, and uh, catering license. So off-site catering. But if you're interested, this in, these are the two topics I want to discuss. If you're interested in the land use guidelines rewrite, um, you please send me an email. It, it's more interesting than you think. Yeah, I think that 
I think Mr. Hop I think John Hopkins was a good speaker to highlight some of the, uh, the factors and the um, issues. All right. Thank, thanks, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to do transportation and traffic and parking. So is that going to be Kurt or? Well, I'll do the uh, local committee stuff, which I guess the survey was done with Ed Tinney and Brian and Dan. Am I correct with that? You know, I don't know, or the transportation committee. Uh, I am now, I'm Kurt Schiller, the new uh, traffic and parking chair. Ed Tenney has uh, a newborn and has taken a little more time than, you know, well, not more time than what he needed, but yeah, he just needed more hours. So I've taken over. All right, but uh, this group really put together a really cool survey and it really pulled up a lot of information and the survey was really addressing uh, traffic, uh, you know, and throughout our neighborhood, and you know the concerns with that, calming, the speed of the vehicles, and safety for everyone involved. There was 120 people that participated in the survey, which uh, 112 of those 120 actually lived within the Upper Fells Point boundary. Um, 85 percent of the respondents wanted to see comment on, uh, you know, the South Wolf and South Washington corridor. You know, do you, do you want me to bring up that the presentation? I'm sorry. Yeah, that'd be really cool. The, the graphs are really good. Yeah, I was thinking it'd be nice if uh, this could be put on a link and put in the e-blast just so everyone, you know, who gets the e-blast could take a look at it and uh... you, Do you want me to talk through it or do you want to? Well, I'll let you guys talk through it, you know, since you uh, you put this together, you probably are more familiar with this format. I have my own sure. format, I, which I gathered the information from this, but it's not going to follow this. I, whatever works for you. All right, go ahead. I'll let you jump in there, Brian. Okay. So, so the, one of the questions was asking whether you had been a victim of a crash or had seen a crash. Um, and uh, you know, over half of people have either been a, a witness or a victim, which indicates a rather large swath of people that, uh, that have been victimized like that. Um, and, and some other background information, just kind of going through this stuff really quickly, kind of understanding how people actually get around. And, um, you know, obviously most people get around with a personally owned car, um, you know, walking, it's a very walkable neighborhood, but we see just how many people use um, either ride share or bicycle um, that ended up being, you know, about a third of the, the participants, the survey said they used a bike, um, you know, 31 people said they used a bike, a, a bus or other mass transit um, before COVID. Um, so this kind of helps us formulate like what, what are some of the priorities we should be looking at? Um, you know, speeding is obviously one of the biggest concerns around here. Um, pedestrian safety, safety at intersections. This, this also kind of shows like where, where as a traffic and parking committee should we be looking? Um, but the, the more meat and potatoes questions that we're looking at were um, whether we support parklets. And that's, that's the idea of using parking spaces to, um, to have outdoor dining or for other community space. Um, and 61% of people supported it, um, you know, almost 40% of people strongly support the idea. The big concerns that people had were about diner safety, you know, if you're, if you're dining in the road, um, making sure that we do it in a safe way, um, obviously parking being a big concern, and also that, uh, that we're doing this in a socially distant manner and that we're not um, cramming people together. Um, there is a lot of really great comments. We actually have all of the survey results out for everybody. So if you wanna look at all the comments, there's some really good stuff. Um, I, this was the best way I could think of to kind of uh, represent it, but the three concerns were the big ones. Uh, the next one was slow streets, and that's similar to what 
they're doing over on Linwood, which is discouraging through traffic, um, kind of looking to slow down traffic so that if you're walking down the street and somebody's coming the other way, you have the option of getting in the road and it not feeling as dangerous uh, with cars. Um, Bank Street had 68% of people support the idea. Uh, Gough Street has 73%, with the biggest concerns being um, walking in the street sounds dangerous. Um, there are some concerns with how Linwood was put in and then uh, concerns with losing parking, which um, depending on how it's, it's implemented, it doesn't need to lose any parking. Um, and the slow streets, if you're looking just at the residents of Bank Street and Gough Street, um, there's still over 50% of, of people that support the idea with quite a few, you know, quarter of people and both basically being neutral on the idea. Um, and the same thing, you know, the big concerns were, were with walking in, in the street and, and safety. Um, and the biggest one was the traffic calming looking at Wolf Street. 85% um, of people supported traffic calming on Washington, 93% supported on Wolf Street. Um, this was the, the most popular one. Um, if you've ever been on, on Wolf or Washington, uh, it's very harrowing. And a lot of the comments that were in there were talking about buildings shaking when cars are going by or close calls or a, a child that got hit. Um, so we're, you know, this is, this is kind of directing what we're going to do. So I'll hand it back to you, Kurt, to talk about the next steps. I'm sorry, what was that, Brian? He's handing it back to you, Kurt. All right, well, that's pretty much it. You know, I don't know where I get Any uh, other questions? Uh, uh, all right, my internet is a little flaky. Uh, I, was, I was handing it back to you to, uh, to pick it up. He's handing it back to you to pick it up. To, to talk about what our next steps are? The Sorry, my, my, oh yeah, well, my, my the letters that we put out to uh, you know the head of DOT and to our council persons and president of the city council, the mayor, um, you know, just giving them the data with some YouTube videos of uh, some of the incidents that, that has taken place and that was uh, captured on camera. Uh, you know, there was two vehicles that, you know, almost ran over a woman in her stroller and her kid, you know, trying to turn on the bank street. Um, it was just a pretty dangerous situation. So, but the speed on, uh, you know, Wolf is pretty, uh, it seems pretty rough, you know, I think. One suggestion that was made by a gentleman that uh, I looked into a little bit, but I haven't reached out to Grishay, uh black shed of DOT yet was the signage that says your speed and then, you know, has the speed limit posted right there with it, you know, because that might slow somebody down. You know, we have the speed camera on Wolf, but that doesn't really seem to slow them. Anybody have any great thoughts on how to slow traffic? All right, pretty much it then for parking and traffic today. Thank you. Hey, sorry, I couldn't get off mute. It's Brian um, McGalley. I, I just had a quick question. How did those bump outs work? They were, you know, bringing the, um, I think it was on Washington, bringing the lanes from two to one um, by Bank or Goff? Well, that would really have to be approved by DOT. Uh, you know, we just, can't do that. Uh, get out of there. Are you talking about the bump outs like on uh, Chester Street where, you know, they have the rain gardens and, you know. Uh, no, I mean, for, for a period of time, there was. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was really good. I thought that should have stayed, you know, the one on Washington. It seemed to slow the vehicles there even though the light was in place. Um, you know, I think it would be great to have that on uh, Wolf Street as well. You know, the problem with that is you uh, will lose a little bit of parking and, uh, you know, people have concerns with that, but, you know, sometimes I think safety overrides the parking, so. 
just a little bit of history. Uh, we we requested that they leave that structure, and uh, uh, DOT was pretty adamant about taking it down. So I think they felt that once they put up the light, uh, uh, they didn't want both. Um, the um, Suzanne wrote Paint the Street. I don't know if you want to check out um, on Green Mount Avenue in front of Open Works or close to Open Works by the City Arts Buildings. They've painted bump outs, really bright, vibrant, just big, like thick stripes. I'm going to say, like maybe each stripe's maybe a one and a half or two feet wide. And they're, they painted the bump out on the, on the street. And it, it looks really pretty. Um, the thing with the, you know, the one on Washington is just like, I feel like as a society, we have to come up with better, something better than plastic flex posts, white plastic flex posts. There just has got to be, I don't know what it is, but there just has got to be a better um, visual than white plastic flex posts. But if anybody's, um, like I said, Greenmount Avenue by Open Works and the City uh, Arts uh, 2, I think is where this, where they painted it. It's, it's pretty Yep, that's it. That's it. They're bigger than two feet. Those doves, definitely. Yeah, those are that. That would be great. Yeah. So I haven't seen this one. This one that you're showing right now, I haven't seen. But the striped one that you showed the first time was the one that I see on Green Mount Avenue. It's it's actually the same installation. It's it's actually just the part I was showing right there was just in the background. Oh, uh, okay. Or or if they brought if they brought at the edge the um you know made the the uh, sidewalk go out further with a tree or something. I guess that's super expensive to do, but that would be a really nice thing and put a tree there to narrow the street. Yeah, I mean, somehow, somehow here, this flex posts don't even look that bad because it's not the central focus when you, you know, of the bump out. Although, again, I think we could come up with something better than that. Um, a cement pillar would definitely detour people. <laughs> do we know, were those flex posts already in place and then they painted? And do we know who did the painting? Was it just citizens? Yeah, it was uh, Graham Coriel Allen. He's we were actually going to work with him on the uh, the Baltimore and Ann Street mural, but we didn't get the funding for that. Okay. Any any more questions for Kurt or thoughts? I just wanted to add that I was coming down Greenmount on my bike and saw that paint, and and it really slowed me down because I wanted to see what it was. So. That was my own personal experience. Well, the interesting thing is, and we, we can maybe go back, but when we were installing the Billie Holiday murals, um, when we got that grant, at one point, part of the proposal was to write <laughs> Lady Day Way down the middle of Durham in cobblestone. We had collected the cobblestone from the DOT yard. We were storing it. We had these block letters that we were going to do and we we're going to work with DOT and then it got nixed because they said that there's a Department of Transportation whatever rule that you can't write anything on the street because it is a distraction to the driver. So I you know I always thought that was really kind of silly um, as there's so many distractions to drivers other than like writing Lady Day Way over like a very long expansive thing but they actually said that was the reason we couldn't do it and so I'm um, I don't know I think it would be interesting to find out whether that actually really exists or if it um I don't know Kurt if you could find out if that really exists or if that was just an excuse that they gave us because they didn't want us to do they didn't want to go through the hassle of like you know having blocks of, of cobblestones that they, they had to actually asphalt around so they just did a, uh, a Black Trans Lives Matters mural on Charles Street. So I don't think, and that was actually permitted. So I don't think that's a rule anymore. Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Brian. 
Um, and then we now we have um, Shakira Smiler, and she is with iMentor Baltimore, and uh, they are an organization that matches mentors to first uh, generation Baltimore high school students. And so I'm going to let Shakira take over. Hi, Shakira. Liz, thank you uh, so much for the invite. Good evening, everyone. Excited to crash your meeting for just a moment. Um, I won't take too long, uh, but I do want to just tell you a little bit more about the iMentor Baltimore program. So again, my name is Shakira Smiler. I'm Director of Mentor Engagement with iMentor Baltimore. I am going to share my screen. All right, can you all see this first slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so to give you a little bit more context and background information about iMentor, we are a national organization. We actually started in uh, New York about 20 years ago. And so we then expanded to Chicago, expanded to the Bay Area, and Baltimore is our fourth region that we just launched uh, last fall. So we are coming up on our second cohort. I'm on the founding uh, Baltimore team. And we are looking for volunteers to uh, mentor our students this upcoming coming fall. So what we do again, is, as Liz mentioned, is we match high school students with uh, college educated professionals who support them on their journeys to post-secondary success. Uh, the program is one in where it's really designed for people who have a busy schedule. And so if you are working, if you have a family, if you're involved in your community, um, it's one in which the time commitment still allows you to have an impact on a young person's life and to fit it into that schedule. And so what our model does is we work specifically with partner high schools and every single student who's at least a junior at that school will get matched with a mentor. So it's not something where the students have have to apply to the program. You don't have to have a certain GPA to participate. It's really designed so that every single student um, has a, a per person in their life who is committed to their individual needs and development. Um, and it really gives you the opportunity to build a relationship with someone. Uh, so with the program model, you communicate with your mentee once a week through our online platform that we have. Um, the platform is something that is uh, proprietary to I mentor and so it's not something where you you know use your own personal email you actually log into the platform to correspond with your mentee and the student emails you during their uh, class period and so the I mentor curriculum is something where we have full-time staff members who teach the class during the school day so the, the uh, program managers is what, what we call them they push into one of the students existing classes for you know one day a week and the students actually write to you during class so it's not something where we are an after-school program we're really there with their teachers um, as a part of their school day. In addition to the weekly writing assignment, mentors meet with their mentee um, once a month. And so pre-COVID, the monthly pair event happened in person at that student's school. Uh, this fall, the program will be entirely virtual. That may or may not extend into the spring, just depending on what happens with COVID, who knows? No one knows what's going on, but we do know that this fall it'll be virtual. Uh, and so the virtual meeting will be something where it's likely gonna be a Zoom call. It may or may not be a group meeting or individually with your mentee. Uh, again, during the normal program, it would happen at the school where you would um, show up like 5 to 7 p.m. So for about two hours once a month, and it'd be kind of all the mentors and the mentees in the cafeteria for that face-to-face -face connection. Uh, the other kind of neat thing about the program is that it's a one-to-one -one match and it's same gender matching. So male identifying students will be matched with a male identifying mentor and the same with female identifying students and mentors. And you are matched with one student for three years. So you get a chance to see them grow, you meet them their junior year, you build that foundation, build that relationship, you stay with them through senior year, and you stay with them through that first year, at least that first year after they graduate from high school. Um, I am going to show a quick video. Oops, sorry, before I get there. So the, the partner schools that we're working with this fall um, are ACE, Academy for College and Career Exploration, and then Baltimore Design School. So ACE is over in the Hamden community, and then BDS is in Greenmount West. This is my mentor, Meredith. So she is a strong, independent woman. This guy, this is Olami Day. This is my mentor, Marissa. She's a very supportive person, and she's always there for me whenever I need like some help. At 
at iMentor, we want to help more students become the first in their families to graduate college. We partner with high schools serving low-income communities and match every student with a college-educated volunteer mentor. To do that, we have to find more people like you who want to give back, supporting a high school student on their journey to college. I have never committed to something for three years before. I uh, looked around the room, saw that I was the oldest person, and you know, was wondering if this was uh, more a program for uh, people in their 20s or 30s. My biggest concern really was that I wasn't going to build a strong relationship with my mentee. That all went out the window once I met Beresford. Through this program, you get, you get to get that big brother figure. You just go up and then down, and then like that. Mentor pairs communicate once a week through our online platform and meet once a month at a group event that iMentor hosts. We know you're busy. The program is accessible and structured to make the most of your time and still get results. Over the past year, I've actually gotten married, gone on my honeymoon, house hunting, all this stuff that's been going on in my life. I still had time to be involved with iMentor. And you won't be in it alone. An iMentor program manager is there to guide you every step of the way. They know your mentee because they teach a weekly iMentor class, which helps them offer personalized support. And they're always there to connect you to the resources you need to be a great mentor. It's like, don't worry, we got you. We know you're not trained in this, but what we want for you is your, is your love and your emotional availability and your want to help. As a first generation college student, I would say he's helped me in the fact that he's been through that. Mentor students are nearly twice as likely as their peers to graduate college. I want her to know that she's really smart and that she deserves to have everything in the world for her, you guys, and that um, she's powerful. You know, I've, I've learned a lot about what it means to be a connected citizen, I think, uh, as part of this process. It means a lot. It doesn't feel like work now. You know, it doesn't seem like I'm going out of my way to do this. You know, in fact, I look forward to it. It's, it's probably one of the best parts of my life right now. Every student deserves a champion. Become a mentor today. Right. So if you if you are interested um, in hearing a little bit more information, we have weekly orientations. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm in the chat box. I just put a link to a form where you can provide your contact information and I can follow up with more details. Um, Liz also has my contact information as well. So if you are interested, you can reach out to me that way uh, with the link that I just put in the chat box. I will not spam you. I'll just follow up with you and send you some more information around next steps so you don't have to remember everything here. But what happens would be uh, we have a weekly orientation. It gives you all the details of the program um, in more detail and more depth. We also have an online application that you would complete. And then each mentor is required to go through a pretty rigorous screening process. And so you have an interview with someone on our national screening team. Uh, we ask for references and you have to pass the Baltimore City uh, Schools background check. And so we make sure that the volunteers are also vetted before connecting them with the young people. Um, again, that's that's it. Short, sweet, to the point. Uh, my name is Shakira. Please let me know if you are interested or have any more questions um, and you have my contact information, complete the form to uh, let me know if you want to hear more information. And thanks so much, Liz, for letting me speak with you all and have a good evening. Thanks. I see, I see a message from Suzanne. She wanted to know um, how many mentors are you looking for? Oh, got it. Perfect. So we need, I forgot to ask if anyone had questions. <laughs> we need about 179 volunteers total, uh, specifically 101 men and 78 women. So we actually need a lot more men. We need everyone at this point. We're only about halfway there and we're hoping to begin matching in October, uh, but we especially need more, more men. Um, so yeah, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so um, I hope some people are going to reach out to Shakira, and it sounds like a great program, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, and again, let me know if you have any other questions. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you. All right, so um, I think if there's nothing else, that's it. All right. All right, Liz, thanks. All right, good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody.